I, I played that last little montage because if anyone can relate to and understand Nancy Pelosi's life as a full-time hate object of the right, it would be you. And so I wonder if you can just, you know, tell me how the attack on Paul Pelosi struck you and what did it tell you about the state of the right in this country and the hate toward a powerful woman? Well, I think your question uh, kind of answers itself, Joy. Um, there's always been uh, a streak of violence, of, uh, you know, racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, as you said. Um, but I think what we're seeing today, and it has certainly been thrown into very high relief by the horrific attack on Paul Pelosi, uh, is not just an aberration where one or two uh, people or a small group engage in that kind of uh, violent rhetoric and urge people to take action against political figures uh, like her, like me, like others. We're seeing a whole political party and those who support it, those who enable it, those who run under its banner, uh, engaging in behavior that is so dangerous and I find, frankly, uh, disqualifying for people uh, who are running for office. You know, this uh, midterm election, we've seen a lot of ads by Republicans running for everything, uh, touting crime. Crime is the issue. But when an 82-year-old man is attacked by an intruder in his own home, they don't seem to be too bothered by that because that person is married to the Speaker of the House, who's of a different political party. I just want your viewers, and really I would like every American, just to stop and think about that. This is the kind of violent rhetoric that leads to violent action that props up authoritarians. And that's unfortunately uh, what we see the Republican Party today uh, supporting. You know, and to your very point, right, th this uh, um, attacker um, allegedly confessed to police that his plan was to kidnap Paul Pelosi, to wait for Nancy Pelosi to come home, and then to hold her hostage, to break her kneecaps if she didn't tell whatever truth it is he thought he could get out of her, and then use her as a symbol to everyone else as to what would be in store for them if they didn't behave as his, you know, sort of right-wing conspiracy theory mind believed they should. I mean, if you think about it, this was a, a kidnapping plot that was directed at mm -hmm. the sitting Speaker of the House. And yes, her husband mm -hmm. is the victim of it because he happened to be her husband and happened to be home. And yet, yeah. you saw mm -hmm. the person who now solely owns Twitter, which, like it or not, is still a giant global public marketplace of ideas, pr promote lies about what happened to Paul Pelosi, promote conspiracy theories about it. With the reach that he has and the fact that his, you know, he and the Saudis own this thing, and that was blasted out to all of his followers and to the world. We're not even in an age of reality well, at that know, point. Joy, well, you know, to his credit, he took that down. Um, I don't see Republicans running for the Congress or governors and many other uh, different positions taking down their uh, violent ads, or I don't see them, you know, curbing their rhetoric. You played something from Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is, you know, calling for the, you know, the death uh, because of treason for uh, Speaker Pelosi. You know, the level of just plain crazy violent hate rhetoric coming out of Republicans. You played something from the, you know, the candidate, the Republican candidate for governor in Arizona. I want viewers, I want voters to stop and ask themselves, would we trust somebody who is stirring up these violent feelings, who is pointing fingers, scapegoating, making a joke about a violent attack on Paul Pelosi? 
Why would you trust that person to have power over you, your family, your business, your community? So I want to take this a step further away from the incident, that terrible incident with Paul Pelosi, and broaden it out. Because what we have with the rhetoric coming from uh, the Republican uh, candidates from their party right now is so disturbing. I didn't see a big outpouring on the part of elected officials uh, to stand with Nancy Pelosi the way she has stood with Republicans as well as Democrats in times of real terror, like on January the 6th. And so ask yourselves, please, why would you entrust power to people who are either themselves unable to see how terrible it is that someone would be attacked in their home or don't really care because they think it will somehow get them votes that will get them elected. This is a real threat to the heart of our democracy. In fact, if uh, Kevin McCarthy were to become speaker, it's very likely that Marjorie Greene um, would get a gavel that she would get a committee, that people like Lauren Boebert would get committees, that people like Matt Gates would be on committees, um, perhaps committees dealing with national security, because he would have to appease them in order to get enough votes to be speaker at all. Are you concerned that maybe voters are not putting those pieces together, that having a Republican House would mean that the people you're talking about would be even more empowered, that faction would be in power? Well, I think with all of the noise that we've got in this election season, um, I don't think people um, are able to really grasp that. But more importantly, I'm not sure they really understand the threats to their way of life. They may think that whoever's chairing a committee is, you know, kind of abstract. But the Republicans in the House and others, like the chair of the Republican Senate Campaign Committee, are on record saying that they are going to put Social Security and Medicare up for a vote. Now, I don't understand why every American, not just people eligible for those two programs that they have paid into, that they have worked hard for, that they have earned, are not up in arms. You know, we've got lots of problems right now in our country. We need sensible people to come together to try to solve them. The last thing we need is to make life even harder for the vast majority of Americans, because it's not just seniors who would have Medicare and Social Security on the chopping block. It would be their children and their grandchildren who would have to step in to fill the hole that would be left by this reckless behavior, this ideological action that the Republicans are promising to take. So there's a whole range of issues. And, you know, sometimes when I tell people that, they say, oh, they would never do that. Well, they told us for 50 years they were going to get rid of Roe v. Wade and turn abortion over to the states where state legislators, local political officials could decide what your health care would be. Why wouldn't you believe them that they are going to go after Social Security and Medicare? I believe them. I take them at their word. You've got everybody, you know, wondering whether it's true. Well, listen to them and watch what they have done and what they say they're going to do. Um Throughout the 2016 campaign, Donald Trump would use lock her up as a call and response to his audience about you. Michael Flynn would repeat it. it uh, I can remember being in the, in the convention um, in, in Cleveland, and it was guttural, the amount of rage directed at you personally. It was very, it felt very mm -hmm. personal. When you look at where we've come since then, to where Donald Trump's ideology has now taken full root in the Republican Party, Carrie Lake laughed at Paul Pelosi, an 82-year-old man being beaten mm -hmm. um, and concussed uh, by an intruder. And that is now just standard. Are you concerned that our democracy is not going to be able to hold past what you can only describe as fascism, violent politics, and demand for power without elections? 
Well, I hope that uh, voters uh, really rally in this uh, last week before the midterms to understand fully what's at stake, to not get diverted. Like I said, you know, the Republicans have been talking about nothing but crime. Then when a crime is committed against Paul Pelosi, they could care less. These people do not really believe half of what they say. I served for eight years in the Senate. I know a lot of the people who are still there, and I don't recognize them. And I do know they know better than what they're talking about, but they think that they need to be part of this, you know, right-wing move that uh, is uh, unfortunately taken over the Republican Party. So we have a week for people to focus. If you have a candidate in your state who laughs about an 82-year-old man being hit with a hammer in his own home, there's something wrong with that person. Why would they want you to laugh with them about a crime? If you have someone running who voted in the House, as the vast majority of the Republicans did, uh, to, you know, turn back the clock on women's rights, to turn back the clock on Social Security and Medicare, then why on earth would you vote for that person? So let's clear away the smoke and the noise and try to focus on what's in your interest. You know, the Republicans have talked a lot about inflation. They've done nothing about it. It's President Biden who has gone after, you know, corporate profits that uh, seem to be way out of whack, particularly for the energy uh, industry, the oil and gas companies. You know, it's President Biden who is trying very hard to inject new energy into our economy, and it's working, you know, here in New York, where I'm talking to you from, two huge announcements that were in many ways promoted because the Congress, the Democrats, finally passed something called the Inflation Reduction Act. So the Republicans talk a good game, but they rarely do anything other than try to take away your freedoms, you know, undermine the quality of our life, make our political discourse violent instead of bringing people together. Why reward that behavior? You have a chance between now and next Tuesday to send a very clear message. You know, we want people who don't laugh at a hammer being hit on someone's head. We want people who will help us solve our problems. And we sure don't want anybody getting elected who's going to put Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block.